live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. More questions tonight after claims of a missing body at a funeral home. Another family sharing similar concerns after seeing our story last night. Their experience involving a cremation. The Defenders update coming up, but first. Let's get to some breaking news on the far west side. Investigators saying a woman shot her ex-boyfriend after a break-in. The night team's Patty Santos is at the scene on Lynx Crossing. That's located near West Military and 151. Patty, what are you learning? Yes, San Antonio police here on this scene. They are telling us that the woman who lives inside the house claimed that her ex-boyfriend broke in. Um, she told officers the boyfriend had been trying to get a hold of her uh, throughout the day. The locks at the house had already been changed, but he somehow managed to get inside through a window. The woman was upstairs on the second floor uh, in the bathroom area armed with a shotgun. She opened fire, hitting him in the torso. The 30-year-old man right now is on his way to University Hospital with life-threatening injuries. Uh, at this point, police say this is still under investigation, but the woman has not been charged. We'll send it back to you. Thank you, Patty. More free COVID-19 testing will be available beginning tomorrow. Instead of driving through, there will be walk-up testing sites. The mayor also saying guidelines for testing have technically changed. We asked him tonight, could you get tested even without symptoms? Here's what he had to say. You know, uh, the, the answer technically uh, right now is yes, because we've opened up the uh, testing protocols pretty widely. So if there is any reason for you to get a test, there is a test available for you. And I just made mention this evening about the mobile testing sites that are gonna be moving around the city. Uh, we have a couple of them opening up tomorrow uh, from nine to five, where you don't need an appointment, you don't need um, it doesn't cost any money. So we're really trying to get tests out there. I will say, though, that the test is most um, accurate and uh, critical for people who are exhibiting some symptom or know they've been exposed. Otherwise, it's really not um, necessary to, to be administered a diagnostic test. In regards to tomorrow's new testing sites, Metro Health and the San Antonio Fire Department's mobile integrated health program partnering to open up two walk up test sites. These test sites do not require an appointment. The test sites are located at Las Palmas Library parking lot on Castroville Road and at Woodlawn Park on Cincinnati Avenue. They'll be open tomorrow through Saturday from 10 in the morning until 5 p.m. More from our interview with the mayor coming up a little bit later in the show. Also, a clearer picture now forming when it comes to the coronavirus response at the Bear County Jail. The Bear County Sheriff joining San Antonio's mayor and judge for the first time during their briefing. But first, let's take a look at the big picture tonight. Tonight, Bear County has 1,761 cases of COVID-19. The number of deaths has increased by one for a total of 53. 834 people have recovered and 60 people remain hospitalized with the disease. And when looking just at the jail, 301 cases are among inmates, 62 among deputies. The night team's Jaffney Gray with an update on recoveries, deaths, and operations at the Bear County Jail. April 17th, the date the Bear County Jail started their mass testing initiative for COVID-19. Sheriff Javier Salazar says since then, they've hit a peak and leveled off. April 28th is when we, we really ramped up testing and it climbed pretty drastically until the 4th, which was so two days ago. Uh, we were at 294. Uh, the last couple of days has been 300 and then today climbed to 301. To date, they've tested 800 inmates and 500 deputies. 62 deputies have tested positive. One deputy has died, but 21 have recovered. 301 inmates have tested positive. 222 of that number asymptomatic. One inmate has died, but 42 have recovered. Salazar says the large number comes from testing hot spots in the jail and unlike other jails, BCSO expanded testing. We're testing each and every person uh, you know, it yeah, it does. It drives your numbers up. Judge Nelson Wolf says because the jail sees 2,100 inmates going and coming from the jail per month, that large asymptomatic number points to a larger picture. I think the jail is an indication that 
you know, a pretty good percent of people out there do have it. Three inmates have bonded out, but we're told Metro Health is checking in with them. Salazar says with 180,000 masks and enough gloves and soap in their supply, their biggest challenge is staffing. You know, every deputy that's out sick, we have to uh, have somebody come in and work overtime because one of the things that even though our jail population is low, we're spreading out our jail population to keep them to keep them distant. Salazar says they expect to finish testing the remaining 200 deputies by the end of the week. 2,000 inmates still need to be tested. Japhne Gray, KSAT 12 News. Give them a date. That's what bar owners are asking after they say they're ready to reopen. But the governor's recent announcement did not include bars. Patty Santos talks to two different bar owners who say the longer they wait, the harder it will be to reopen. She also breaks down why the government says bars are different than other businesses. It's a little strange to walk into an empty bar when we're kind of used to being a vibrant, you know, neighborhood spot. It's been 52 days since Squeezebox Bar north of downtown last opened for business. It has been a little frustrating in the sense that we are eager to get back to business. It's just that we want to do it safely and timely. Out near the airport, Main Street bar owner Tony Keo has been trying to keep his mind off the closure by doing some renovations. By the 18th, it would have been two months already, and that's, you know, that's a long time to not generate any revenue at all. They want a plan and a firm reopening date from the state, but they get it. Safety is important. I understand that. I mean, bars are, you know, communal places. People hang out, have a good time. According to the city of San Antonio COVID-19 health transition team report, the risk of someone contracting the virus ranked high at bars when compared to other businesses like restaurants and retail. The way I feel, if you're old enough to be in here, you should be able to make an uh, educated decision about how to keep yourself safe. The governor wants suggestions on a reopening plan from bar owners, but with more than 1,100 mixed beverage permit holders in Bear County alone, a one size fits all approach might not exist. The longer we stay closed, the harder it will be to have a successful reopening. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. After being forced to stay closed by city officials, Traders Village San Antonio will be reopening this weekend. They're going to give it another try. The change comes after we asked the Texas Division of Emergency Management about flea markets. The city says businesses should continue to contact the Texas Division of Emergency Management to learn if their businesses can reopen. While Traders Village will reopen, rides will not be operated. No live music. There will be limited food stands. Vendors and customers are all asked to wear face coverings. A shocking discovery leads to reunions for two families. Last night, we introduced you to the De Leon family, who claim a local funeral home lost their grandmother's body. Now, a second family claims the same thing happened to them at a separate funeral home. The night team Stephen Cavazos was there as both families received closure in an unexpected way. It's tonight's Defenders Update. Emotions running high as two families came together to mourn the loved ones they thought they lost. We thought we would never see her again, so we're happy that she's home. <laughs> Irene Blanco spoke to the defenders Tim Gerber yesterday. Blanco claimed the Castillo Mission Funeral Home lost her grandmother's body. 78-year-old Dolores Gutierrez de Leon was expected to be laid to rest last Friday, but the woman inside the casket was someone else. The woman that we had in the casket that was presented to us, we knew she had a family and they deserved to mourn her. That woman turned out to be Rosita Esquivel. Rosita Esquivel's service was supposed to be held at Funeral Care in USA, but because of a family dispute, not all the family intended. But it was after seeing photos of the woman in the casket they knew that wasn't their mother. But by then, the body had been cremated. Pictures say a thousand words. We know positively for sure that's her now. Both families arriving here to the Castillo Funeral Home, and that's where the Esquivel family were able to identify their mother. But when we reached out to the funeral home for a comment, doors were locked and we were asked to leave. But after our story with the De Leons aired last night, both families were able to piece together the mystery. Esquivel's son says he felt the ashes in the urn was someone else. And tonight, the Esquivel family gave the urn to Irene Blanco and her family. If this is a sign of something, please let me know. And sure enough, it came out. Both families now reunited with their loved ones and bonded for a lifetime. Hugs, prayers, anniversaries, 
we're here for them. We're going to be here for them. Blanco says she and her families will always be grateful to the Esquivels and thankful they have their grandmother back home just in time for Mother's Day. We're all we're all together and now we're complete. So Stephen Cavasso's KSAT 12 News. What an emotional scene. We reached out tonight to Funeral Care in USA and again to Castillo Mission Funeral Home. Both declined to comment. De Leon's family has hired attorney Mar Mark Greenwald to represent them. He is the same attorney who handled the case of Julie Mott, whose body was stolen from a different funeral home in San Antonio back in 2015. It's still ahead on the night beat tonight. We're going to take questions over our supply of personal protective equipment through KSAT's Truth Index. Where do we stand coming up? And we're taking your questions to the mayor tonight in our coronavirus Q&A. And one local high school moving forward with their graduation ceremony just in a different way. The drive through operation and the valedictorian who's leading the class. Next on the Night Beat. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. Bernie ISD school officials announcing their schedule for graduation for high school seniors. Graduation dates are moved to June 4th for Champion High School, June 5th for Bernie High School. The ceremonies will still be held at the Bernie ISD Stadium at 8 p.m. School officials say the ceremonies may include space seating, sanitizing stations, face mask requirements, and possible ticket limitations. For graduates not participating in the ceremony, paper diplomas will be available for pickup the week after graduation. By the way, Governor Greg Abbott laid out four different graduation ceremony options to help school districts celebrate their seniors' achievements. Schools can do virtual ceremonies, drive-through ceremonies similar to car parades, a hybrid with both online and in-person with limitations, and outdoor in-person ceremonies can only be held in rural counties that have not been hit hard by COVID-19. On the city's southeast side, one high school is choosing the drive through option along with some online aspects. East Central High School is adapting so they can hold a graduation ceremony for their 792 seniors. It's the largest class in the history of East Central. The night team's Courtney Friedman introduces us to the young lady now leading that class as valedictorian. I was actually leaving a day early because I was going to visit my grandparents for spring break and um, I hugged my track coach, Coach Tomlinson, and I said, okay, I'll see you on Monday after spring break. That was the last thing. Emily Hoffman remembers the last day she spent at East Central High School. In the midst of the pandemic, the valedictorian now pre-recording her speech for the 2020 class. Never in a million years would we have imagined that the week before spring break would be the last days of our senior year. After facing the challenges of online learning and social distancing, the graduates and their families won't miss out on pomp and circumstance on May 30th. Principal Shane McKay says graduates will be in a parade of cars, each with their own family members inside. We're going to be broadcasting on uh, YouTube Live and Facebook Live. Graduates can also tune into an FM radio station carrying the ceremony. After their name is called, graduates will be able to drive up to a staging area. Our trustees will be handed their diploma uh, after it's been, of course, uh, sanitized and wiped down as per the, the guidelines. Uh, and we'll be able to hand and congratulate the, uh, the senior uh, that will be in the front passenger uh, side. East Central will also be playing speeches online. Hoffman's speech will be one of them. She's now set to attend the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado to begin her dream of attending medical school. As she looks into the future, Hoffman recognizes the silver lining in an abrupt end to her senior year. We really had normal last days of high school, and I really think that's actually um, a blessing in some aspect because instead of kind of grieving the separation that's about to happen, you just enjoy being with your friends and teachers. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Oh, with such a large class, the graduation ceremony will be split into three groups and three hours. It'll run from 8 in the morning until 11 a.m. on May 30th. There will also be a photographer on hand to help capture this moment. Congratulations, seniors. Yeah, and a lot East Central and all of them. A lot of them will, yeah. they will never forget. Oh, for sure. Their graduating year. They'll that be, is for sure. 
they'll be sharing it with their grandkids. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be that's the thing. Just remember back when, you know, oh, unbelievable. All right, so I, I do want to talk a little bit about our rain chances, our lake levels, and of course some temperature swings that are headed our way. So let's start with a look at lake levels and compared to this time last year, we are definitely down. We are still down. Look at Medina Lake, for example, it's 70% full right now, so 14 feet below the conservation pool, and that's nearly 14 feet lower than this time last year. Canyon Lake, usually more stable level, it's at 94%, and that's three feet below the conservation pool, and Amistad down four, 14 feet compared to, the, this, to this time last year. Okay, looking at the rainfall that we had earlier this morning, we actually had a few little pop-up spotty showers out there. This is the epitome of 30% chance. You see, most of us didn't get any rain, but a few locations actually had some good downpours, especially east of San Antonio, DeWitt County, the western corner there had 1.7 inches estimated, even right over Cuero, 1.3 inches estimated. You get just basically southwest of Poteet and west of Pleasanton there, 1.2 inches in that little corner of Atascosa County. So some folks were very lucky. Early this morning, most of us, however, well, we were dry. And down in the valley, we had some showers throughout the afternoon, but across the rest of the state, very quiet. So we have a few other features to talk about. We have this much cooler air off to the north that's pooling up. A lot of it's in Canada right now. And we're going to tap into just the edge of that air mass as this next system moves our way. And with these cold fronts, sometimes we get some good rain chances. With this one, unfortunately, we're looking at about a 20% chance on Friday and beyond then our next best chance is 30% next Tuesday. So rain chances unfortunately still looking pretty slim. So let's talk about that cooler air that's going to be plunging southward. It's going to affect your weekend. That's for sure. Most of Texas still in the 70s, but I want to actually take us up into Canada, Eastern Canada, where temperatures are way below normal down in the 20s and even some teens there. Okay, this is like winter like air that's pushing southward and we're just going to get clipped by that air mass, but it'll be enough to drop us about 10 degrees below average as we start our weekend. So right now, 82 Del Rio, 75 in Hondo, 71 in New Braunfels, 72 here in San Antonio. Our high temperatures today, we're right near average in the mid 80s. Tomorrow, no, well, Thursday, similar, 85 degrees. Friday is when we start to see that cold front affect us closer to 80, and then boom, on Saturday, we're down in the 70s for high temperatures rebounding just a little bit into Sunday Mo Mother's Day. But because of that front and us getting clipped by that air mass, we're not talking 90s anytime soon, not within the foreseeable future here. Dew points are down for now. When we wake up, you'll start to notice the humidity. Even just by 10 a.m., you'll notice the mugginess in the air. Dew points in the 60s, and then by tomorrow afternoon, we're in the thick of the humidity, but it's not going to last long. We sweep away the humidity Friday afternoon through Mother's Day weekend and even early next week. You won't even think of the humidity. So some clouds to start the day, a little bit of sunshine in the afternoon, 61 in the morning, 85 for the high and also a breezy day tomorrow with that southeasterly wind at 15 to 20. Gusty again on Friday and that's when we have that slight chance of rain, otherwise looking dry through the weekend. Sunday, Mother's Day, look at that low humidity, 50s in the morning, near 80 in the afternoon, sunny. Enjoy our Mother's Day gift from Mother Nature. There you go. Thank you, Adam. All right, if I'm getting this correct, Greg, it sounds like Adam Silver's asking for a roll call. Pretty much. He wants all NFL players on a conference call on Friday. NBA. This, the NBA, yes. Yes. The same day that they are planning on opening as many training facilities as they can. When we come back, more about what Adam Silver has to say about the big conference call and calling all NBA players. And what are the NFL's plans in case they can't get games played and more specifically played without fans when we come back? I can't tell you how appreciative I am of the players. We sat down with Chris Paul, Michelle Robb. NBA players and with Commissioner Adam Silver. This comes on the very day the league is permitting teams to reopen their practice facilities for voluntary workouts in states that do not have restrictions. Three teams say they're planning to reopen on Friday, including the Cleveland Cavaliers, the Denver Nuggets, and the Portland Trailblazers. But here in Texas, Governor Greg Abbott says gyms will not be allowed to reopen until May 18th. Now, even though the NBA has cleared team practice facilities open this Friday, there will be restrictions, including only four players at the facility at one time and no coaches will be allowed. Spurs President
President and CEO R.C. Buford said that does not mean the Spurs will open their practice facility on Friday, saying it would depend on if medical experts determine it's safe to do so for players and if state regulation would allow. Right now, that would not be the case. A hiatus has given several players who were injured a chance to improve since the shutdown began on March 11 due to the coronavirus. And should the league decide to resume play rather than cancel the rest of the season, Ben Simmons may be one of those players that benefits from the hiatus. The 76ers all-star guard is getting closer to getting cleared to play after dealing with nerve issues in his lower back to force him to miss eight straight games before the league was put on hold. That's according to Sixers general manager Elton Brand. But keep in mind, Simmons, like all NBA players, have yet to play during any five-on-five workouts. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The NFL is set to announce its regular season schedule tomorrow night at 7 p.m., but before that happens, Commissioner Roger Goodell has ordered that all teams must have a ticket refund policy in place in case games are canceled or play without fans during the coronavirus. In a memo sent to all 32 teams obtained by the Associated Press, Goodell said all clubs will have a policy in place to cover those two possibilities for anyone purchasing a ticket directly from the team with the option to either receive a full refund or apply the amount toward a future ticket purchase directly from the club. But what about secondary market? The league also says it has received pledges from both Ticketmaster and SeatGeek to make full refunds available for all ticket sales within no more than 30 days following the cancellation. StubHub said it will only do so required by state law. At the same time, the NFL is planning on kicking off its season on time, but Goodell admits in the memo these are unique circumstances facing us this year. Former Houston Texans cornerback Jonathan Joseph has decided to sign a one-year contract with the Texas a division rival, the Tennessee Titans. That's after he spent the last nine seasons with the Texans before the team parted ways with him. The two-time Pro Bowl selection has posted 31 interceptions to go along with his 750 tackles in his 14-year career that also included five seasons with the Cincinnati Bengals. His 194 passes defended are the most by any NFL player in the last two decades. He's coming off a season in Houston where he played 14 games for the Texans with 51 tackles and one interception. The chances of former Texas defensive star Jadavian Clowney re-signing with the Seattle Seahawks is looking less likely now unless the defensive end wants to take less money. The Texans traded their former number one overall pick to the Seattle Seahawks just before last season kicked off for pass rusher Barcavius Mingo, linebacker Backer Jacob Martin and third round draft pick. Clowney had been seeking a new contract averaging $21 million a season, but the Seahawks only have around $21 million in cap space. That prompted Clowney to drop his asking price from $21 million a season to between $17 and $18 million. According to ESPN, the ESPYs have become the latest live event to be affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Instead of a live broadcast in Los Angeles this July, including red carpet, the annual award show will shift its focus from honoring athletic accomplishments to celebrating acts of heroism and humanitarian aid during the pandemic. It will not be broadcast on ABC as a live event, but instead will be a two-hour broadcast produced that will now air on June the 21st. It will include the Arthur Ashe Award for Courage, the Pat Tillman Award for Service, and the Jimmy V Award for Perseverance, to name a few. The first live sport in America to return during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next. This is how Steel Knights quarterback Wyatt Beagle has to work out during the COVID-19 pandemic as he prepares for his upcoming senior season at Steel High School and eventually his college career. His workouts have been limited to his parents' house with his father James catching passes and working his footwork on the sidewalk. That's after he verbally committed to Arkansas State last January. They always want you to come in and compete. It's all about competition. So uh, he's going to start the best, whether that's me or, or a quarterback there. You know, I don't know. I'll find out when I get there. But I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep doing um, my best to get a starting spot. If that doesn't happen, you know, I'm fine with that. I'm glad where I'm at um, when I get there. And uh, that will just give me more motivation to continue to work. Congratulations. UFC will be the first live sporting event in North America this Saturday night when 24 fighters compete at the UFC 249, 249 in Jacksonville in a fan-free arena. There are strict protocols and plans as the mixed martial arts event returns from an eight-week hiatus with three events in eight days in Florida. That seems to be kind of their central location right now is having these fights staged just in one state, just in one location for now without fans. All right. Thank you, Greg. Uh, we want to get to some breaking news tonight. The search is on for a missing swimmer. The Guadalupe County Sheriff's Office says a swimmer was last seen in the Guadalupe River south of FM 1117. That swimmer is described as an 18 year old male wearing gray swimming trunks. An emergency notification has been placed to residents in that area. Aircraft 
are also in route to assist. If anyone sees any person in this area matching that description, again, an 18 year old wearing gray trunks, please note the location and contact that office at the number there on your screen, 830-379-1224 or also dial 911. Yeah, you could imagine just a, a desperate search at this point yeah. in dark looking for this missing swimmer. We'll be right back. More than 73,000 people in this country have now died from the novel coronavirus. Some states are recording an increase in cases or deaths even as they relax some of those restrictions. ABC's Marcy Gonzalez has the latest on the pandemic and its impact. The number of COVID-19 cases rising in at least 19 states with hot spots now popping up in rural parts of the country, according to FEMA. The highest infection rate in the country now in Tennessee, where cases in the state's largest prison soared from 27 to more than 1,300 in just 10 days. In Illinois, the largest one-day death toll since the pandemic began recorded just this week. And in Texas, one of 38 states that have now eased restrictions allowing some businesses to reopen a thousand new cases recorded in one day other business owners there still waiting for the green light frustrated this bar owner arrested for opening early i will lose my business my bartenders are already starving to death i see my bar owner friends can't even pay for their medical medicines uh this is terrible a small public school in Montana set to be one of the first in the nation to reopen Thursday, putting precautions in place as they open their doors to students for 16 days before summer break begins. We have the space but we also have very small numbers, and that's the only reason we can open it. The virus also having an impact on the nation's meat supply and access to food. One study finding 9 million children under the age of 12 in this country now suffer from food insecurity. As scientists now study mutations in the virus that causes COVID-19 and new human trials begin for potential vaccines, President Trump reversing course on plans to disband the coronavirus coronavirus task force in the coming weeks. So we'll be leaving the task force indefinitely. We'll Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Los Angeles. The fighting fear with facts, it's what we're trying to do every night during this pandemic at around this time. Tonight, we're joined by Mayor Ron Nuremberg, who joins us each and every Wednesday or has since this crisis began. Mr. Mayor, thank you for being with us tonight. Good evening. Great to be with you. I, I want to get to some of our questions and some of our viewer questions tonight. The first question is one that I've had for a while. Have you actually been tested for COVID-19? No, I have not. Um, obviously, I'm grateful that I haven't been, uh, haven't exhibited symptoms or been exposed to anyone who's had it, um, thankfully. But, uh, you know, when, once the asymptomatic testing really ramps up, I might just go in just for peace of mind, but we're not there yet. Are you still concerned that not enough people are getting tested? I know this was a concern for you at one point when we were talking about the Freeman Coliseum site. Are you concerned that people aren't showing up to get tested who maybe should be getting tested? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, and that's why we've been pushing the message uh, so loudly uh, every night, which is that if you have a symptom, uh, if you've been exposed, if there's reason you believe that you need a test, you should go get a test. And, you know, we have to bust some myths, bust some myths about that. You don't need a doctor. You don't need a primary care provider. You don't need health insurance. You don't need money to go get a test. If you need to be tested, we want you to get tested. And so we have the mobile clinic set up. We have uh, private providers that are providing it. We have the drive uh, up clinic, uh, drive up uh, testing site at Freeman. There's a lot of places to get them. We want to make sure people are taking the test. Right. And again, for what you said, you don't need money. You don't need insurance. You don't need a doctor. That's right. If you have the symptoms, go get tested. Absolutely. Okay. 100 percent. The next question has to do. I know that you have uh, voiced some concerns in the past about people not wearing their masks in places where they yes. should be. Are masks becoming a political issue? Unfortunately, they are, as most things tend to be in this day and age, but it, it really shouldn't be. This is guidance from um, every part of the political spectrum when it comes to health 
professionals. Uh, this is CDC guidance. It's local public health authority guidance. It is common sense to wear a mask. And the reason is we know that there's a high rate of infection that we just aren't seeing uh, that in which people don't show symptoms. They're not feeling sick. They're they're asymptomatic. And there's not enough research to determine whether or not the asymptomatic uh, infected individuals are really um, infecting a lot of others are very contagious. We know that the contagion factor goes down when somebody's wearing a mask. So for the protection of other people, whether you feel sick or not, or if you feel sick, you shouldn't be going out. But if you don't feel sick, you may in fact be infected and we want you to wear a mask. And until we really have vaccines and other therapeutics that directly address this issue, people are gonna have to get used to wearing masks. That's really our main, one of our main ways as we open up of slowing the spread of this virus. Somebody asked on my Twitter account tonight, when do you think we'll get to the point where we don't have to wear masks? I, I think it's gonna be some time, unfortunately. This is just gonna be a, another accessory that people leave the house with for a while. I think until we get very clear um, uh, guidance about antibody testing, and te antibody testing is done en masse across the country, uh, which we're not at yet because uh, the antibody tests that have been available are very inaccurate. Um, and they're starting to roll out a little bit faster, but we don't, we're not there yet with the antibody testing nationwide. And the other issue is there's no vaccine. There's really no therapeutics that are proven to work with this disease. So um, in order for us to limit the spread of it, we're asking people to wear masks. The public health officials are asking people to wear masks. Um, some people think it's silly. Uh, the health officials will tell you it's saving lives. When will the San Antonio Public Library reopen? The next viewer question. That's a great question. And we are working uh, with our library officials right now on a reopening strategy. Uh, right now, they remain closed. They remain closed based on the health transition team guidance. But we're getting closer, especially as we see data that we've really flattened the curve, um, that we can begin to open those up uh, in Bear County. Uh, the bibliotheques have been open now to provide some access uh, to technology. Um, the problem with the libraries, the traditional libraries, is that there's a lot of exchange of goods, hard goods. And so there's a lot of uh, mixing and mingling that doesn't take place at, say, a digital library like bibliotech. So there's a little bit different, and so we're going to be cautious, but we're work working on a transition plan there. Okay. Our next question comes from viewer I. Romero, E.C.S. Romero, maybe. Uh, now, now that we've shifted from crisis to recovery mode, what is the biggest challenge in your opinion? You know, our, our biggest challenge, um, I think, is to sustain the energy uh, and the focus on ensuring that we need to build a healthy, durable, resilient economy. Uh, and that first requires us to have healthy people. So as we begin to recover and open things up, mind the public health guidance, because that's going to be a very basic element of us continuing to open up. But then I think it's going to be focus on what are the underlying health issues of our economy, not just people, but also the entire economy. We know that there's a huge uh, income disparity issue we've got to address, and it's going to change the way this economy, it has changed the way this economy functions, and it's made it susceptible to this crisis. Uh, we do know that the digital divide has been exposed uh, and, and how it really threatens the livelihoods of many families in this community. And we've also seen that uh, we really need to get people back into work so the paychecks start coming and people can start you know, um, paying bills again and, and paying rent and, 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 and enjoying the, the fruits of a live economy. Unless we do those things in a resilient manner that addresses some of the underlying issues that we've known have had to be dealt with in our, our economy, we're only uh, achieving short-term gain. But I can tell you, myself, Judge Wolf, the city council, the commissioner's court are focused on building a long-term, durable, resilient economy for everyone. Next question, is it possible you will implement fines or issue more direct orders if businesses aren't following practices recommended by the economic transition team? It says transmission uh, team, but it means transition team. So. Yeah, well, so we will continue to enforce the orders as we have been before. And, um, you know, and that means that if there is guidance that it is just being violated willfully, uh, then we, we will enforce it. And that could include uh, penalties, civil penalties. 
Uh, but I will tell you that the vast, uh, the, the reason why we've been able to achieve some success here with flattening the curve is because people understand and, and trust the health professionals in our community that what they're doing works, what they're guiding us to do works. Um, and, you know, but, but for egregious violations for people who are willfully putting other people and the, and their employees per, per potentially at risk, then there will be an enforcement um, mechanism to this. But I view that as, as a measure of last resort that we haven't had to go to, uh, but for a few times. Right. Okay. Last question I'd like to give to you. What do you want our viewers to know tonight? Oh gosh. Well, what I want, so we've talked a lot about staying the course, um, you know, stay home, save lives. All that is still true. Uh, continue to do uh, the physical distancing and wearing masks when you're out in public and within six feet of someone. That is absolutely true. Continue to do that. We're not out of the woods. But I do have to say, uh, you deserve a huge debt of gratitude because the data shows that this community has saved the lives of our loved ones and neighbors a lot. Uh, thousands of lives. Uh, we've helped flatten the curve and saved uh, the, the lives potentially of the healthcare workers and frontline employees that would have to deal with uh, overcapacity at hospitals and other emergency response uh, facilities. Uh, so it has worked and we have done a great job of flattening cur the curve. Now we want to open up and enjoy life and start to get back to, to business. Uh, we want to make strategic steps forward and only walk forward together uh, we don't ha want to have to walk backwards. So let's do it together strategically, thoughtfully, according to the public health officials. And then we can look back at, um, you know, the, the, the mountain that we've climbed together and how stronger and better off we are for it. Mayor Ron Nuremberg, I appreciate your time. ECs, thanks you for answering her question too. <laughs> Thank you, ECs. Thank you, Steve. All right. Take care. We'll be right back. You too. We've heard over the past few weeks from the mayor and the county judge that there is a good supply of personal protective equipment at our main local hospitals and there is no shortage. Even so, we've had some questions from you, our viewers, about whether that's actually true. So the night team's Courtney Friedman ran it through our KSAT trust index to make sure that's the case. It's been part of the panic that's accompanied the pandemic across the globe, personal protective equipment or PPE. Many places like New York City drowning in COVID-19 cases have constantly had a shortage of PPE in hospitals. In San Antonio, however, we've been told that's not the case, but we wanted to check for ourselves. A spokeswoman for Methodist Health System confirmed their PPE supply is strong. That's in great part due to their inventive disinfectant system. Methodist Healthcare piloted the use of UV light to disinfect N95 masks and develop the process to safely transport, disinfect, and return the masks to healthcare workers. The system, called ultraviolet germicidal irradiation, or UVGI, is now being used across the country. It allows masks to be sterilized six times before being thrown away, but to be safe, Methodist is tossing them after five uses. They're currently disinfecting about 200 masks a day for all Methodist facilities. Now to University Health System, which sends out weekly updates, including information about the PPE supply. Today, a spokeswoman confirmed the supply has recently improved, saying, now that the supply chains are reopening, we are stocking up. We had previously been on a just-in-time inventory management system. Baptist Health System, including St. Luke's Hospital, also has no shortages. A statement from leadership today saying, we can safely care for our patients with the supplies we currently have. Christus Santa Rosa hospitals and clinics have a strong supply, saying today, not to say it hasn't been a challenge to think creatively, but we are in a really good position right now. They have also created a mask repurposing system for Santa Rosa and the Children's Hospital. UT Health San Antonio has clinics and labs across the city with its healthcare workers and researchers on the front line. They say they do not have a shortage and are closely monitoring our PPE and providing universal masking to our employees. With all these confirmations, we are labeling the information given by officials on local PPE supply as true on our KSAT Trust Index. Court that was Courtney Friedman reporting. Now, Brook Army Medical Center told us today their supply is also strong. During an April 30th news conference, the Department of Defense announced they will be, quote, cranking out masks for a very long time, end quote. 
If you have information, pictures, or videos that you're unsure about and want the KSAT Trust Index team to check it out, just submit it to ksat.com slash trustindex. For those hoping to explore the Witty Museum once again or visit for the first time, you should know the museum has set reopening dates for the end of the month. Members will receive early access of May 27th, while the general public may visit beginning May 30th. The museum will operate at 25% capacity for the time being. Interactive exhibits will be removed and visitors will be given a stylus pen to interact with the museum's touch screens. There are also online events right now called Witty Where You Are. We have a link on KSAT.com. I want to give a big congratulations to Bernie ISD as HEB announced the district has taken home top honors for best small school district in Texas. It's part of HEB's statewide excellence in education awards. Judges from HEB visited Bernie campuses throughout the year. That plus an in-depth application submitted by the district earned them the prize. That prize, by the way, $50,000. Let's take a live look outside with live cam, a very beautiful and comfortable 72 degrees out there right now. Adam? It is. It's pleasant outside, and we had that lack of humidity in the air today, which so many of us enjoy, especially if you work outdoors. Uh, not having that mugginess uh, definitely helps you out. All right, let's talk about our day today and then look ahead to what's coming down the pike. And I just have to look back at this sunset. It was gorgeous out there. Not a whole lot of color, but I love the pattern in the clouds that we had there as we put this in motion. Sunset, by the way, 8.14 p.m. Started the day at 69, ended the afternoon at 87 for the high temperature. Both of them a little above average for this time of year. So we didn't have a whole lot of smoke in our air here in San Antonio today, south of town. We did uh, south of San Antonio and especially basically from about Eagle Pass toward Corpus Christi. And that's, of course, from the agricultural fires down in Central America and even parts of Mexico. But notice as we go into tomorrow and then tomorrow afternoon, Friday, we are expecting a little increase in the smoke in the air. I don't anticipate it to be a lot, but the models are indicating we could have a little bit of extra smoke in the air by Friday morning before our next change in weather pattern and cold front comes to get rid of it all for the weekend. And speaking of the cold front, you see this big dip in the upper level flow over the eastern part of the country. That's pulling some cooler air southward from Canada, and we're just going to get clipped by that cooler air mass. So 90s, not even in the forecast anytime soon. Actually, we'll be running 10 degrees below average by Saturday. So looking at the readings now, Rio Medina 69, along with Bandera, 64 in Comfort, 73 Stinson and Pleasanton, and it's nice and comfortable out there. For the most part, we're in the 70s and 60s. Now, when you wake up tomorrow morning, we'll have some 50s in the hill countries, but 61 in San Antonio, 66 Carrizo Springs, and then by the afternoon, we'll be in the mid 80s here around Bear County. But lower 90s the farther west and south you get to San Antonio. Not bad in terms of humidity. Dew points are down in the 40s, but that changes overnight and tomorrow you're going to start noticing the mugginess in the air. Then by Friday with the arrival of the cold front, we get rid of the humidity by Friday afternoon, lasting all the way through the weekend and Monday. So a big stretch without the humidity that's going to be the humidity is going to be gone 61 in the morning 85 in the afternoon a little more cloud cover than sunshine and a bit breezy tomorrow gusty on your friday 81 degrees and then saturday ooh, only 75 for that high temperature and then beautiful and comfortable into mother's day thank you adam an update on a case involving so-called power plasma we followed the story of jimmy hayden and his recovery now his wife and son are hoping to help others like one man helped hate their story up next. Don't think that's the right video, but we'll have it for you. The family of a man who they believe is alive right now because of a plasma transfusion went to the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center today to pay it forward. Last month, Jimmy Hayden was on a ventilator battling COVID-19 until he received plasma with antibodies from a former patient. A day or two later, he began to improve significantly. It's a story our Devin Clark has been following closely. Tonight, he shares how Hayden's wife and son are hoping to make the same impact on other families.
It's the least I could do is be able to donate and help somebody else. Just over a month ago, Wyatt Hayden was worried about losing his father, 47-year-old Jimmy Hayden, to COVID-19. That is until Jimmy received plasma with antibodies from a former patient and began to recover almost immediately. For Wyatt, who recently turned 18, the timing couldn't have been better. Fortunate enough, he got to come home to see us for my birthday and he got to spend it with him. Uh, he was quarantined in his room uh, for most of the day, but we got to go sit outside and enjoy like the nice air. It's a present Wyatt and his mother, Ashley Hayden, who both experienced light symptoms, didn't take for granted and wanted to share. We were very uh, much wanting to help others the way we were helped. So we decided to get the antibody testing and found out we were positive with the antibodies. The plan was for both mother and son to donate today. You have to have an iron level of 12.5. My level was at 12. So I was really close, but not there to be able to donate today. So instead, Ashley deferred her plans and cheered her son on, though for both of them, having their loved one back was more than enough motivation to help the cause. Since I can't, couldn't help my husband and I couldn't be there with him at the hospital, this is what I wanted to do to help others. Ashley Hayden says she plans to take iron supplements and may even be able to donate alongside her husband and another child who plan to do the same. For information on finding out if you're eligible to donate plasma that could help a sick COVID-19 patient, just visit our website, ksat.com. Reporting outside the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center says 31 recovered patients have donated their plasma so far. Each donor can provide about three to four units of plasma and can donate multiple times. We'll be right back. That's it for the night beat. Don't forget, Good Morning San Antonio starts at 430. Good night.